we are starting tonight the Mahahatipadopama Sutta, which is the greater discourse on the elephant's footprint simile. There's a Maha and a Chula, there's a lesser discourse as well. We're doing the greater one. This, unusually, like the Samaditi Sutta, is spoken by Venerable Sariputta. The structure of the Sutta, I included a little outline at the beginning of the text, which we can uh, go through now. <coughs> the point it's making is that all of the Buddha's teachings can be found within the Four Noble Truths, that everything the Buddha taught after his first sermon, in which he uh, defined the Four Noble Truths, everything he taught after that time is simply an elaboration of, or a development of, things which he put into the first sutta. And so the, the elephant's footprint is large enough to contain the footprint of any other animal. In the same way, the Four Noble Truths contain all the other teachings. Would you like, please, to read us the... Start from the beginning? Start from the beginning, yes. The structure. Who fashions bamboo goods. First, he selects a well-grown bamboo and cuts it into four. Putting aside three sections, he takes the fourth and divides it into five parts. Of these, again, he lays aside four, takes the fifth and splits it into five pieces. Again, he puts away four pieces, takes the fifth and splits it into a lower and top portion. Laying aside the top portion, he takes the lower one, being softer, and fashions off it various kinds of bamboo goods. But this does not mean that he will not utilize for his work the remaining portions of the bamboo. That is, the top portion, the other four small pieces, the larger four parts, and the original three sections. He cannot make use of them all at once but he utilizes them gradually. Starting his great discourse, takes up as the main subject the four truths corresponding to the bamboo worker's first four sections. Then, as the man puts aside three of them, takes the fourth and divides it into five parts. Similarly, Venerable Sariputta lays aside three of the truths, takes one, the truth of suffering and gives it a fivefold division by way of the five aggregates, the khandas. Then, again similar to the bamboo worker, he puts aside four of them, the four mental aggregates, and takes one, the aggregate of form, rupa khanda, and gives it a fivefold classification, namely as the four great elements and form derived from the four great elements. Again, as the bamboo worker puts aside four pieces, takes the fifth and splits it into top and lower portion. So Venerable Sariputta lays aside and derived form. As the craftsman puts aside the top portion and makes various bamboo articles from the lower portion, so Venerable Sariputta Laying aside the external earth element, divides the earth element in oneself into 20 modes. Namely, in the discourse, pass, discourse passage beginning, what is earth element in oneself? And finally, just as the man utilizes gradually the remaining sections, parts, pieces, and portions of his work, as he could not use them all at once. So Venerable Sariputta, too, gradually explains also 
the remaining parts of his subject matter, namely the external earth element and other three elements derived from the four mental aggregates and the other three noble states, as he could not do so all at once. He's taking the four noble truths, but he starts by just isolating one, the first noble truth the noble truth of dukkha, or suffering. And he is going to make the point that the definition of dukkha in the first sermon contains various ways of explaining dukkha, but the last way is the five aggregates of clinging. And this is what Sariputta is going to take up to explain in greater detail. Please, go ahead. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Savati in Jeta Road, another Pindikar Park. There, the Venerable Sariputta addressed the bhikkhus thus, Friend, bhikkhus, friend, they replied. The Venerable Sariputta said thus, Friends, just as the footprint of any living thing that walks can be placed within an elephant footprint, and so the elephant's footprint is declared the chief of them because of his great size, so too all wholesome states can be included in the Four Noble Truths. In what form? in the noble truth of suffering, in the noble truth of the origin of suffering, in the noble truth of cessation of suffering, and in the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. The term or wholesome states. The word is kusala dhamma, sometimes translated as all wholesome things. But we can't say that there are only wholesome things in the first noble truth because it includes uh, dukkha, it includes uh, suffering and uh, craving. So we can't say that the four noble truths only contain wholesome things, but we can say that they contain wholesome states of mind. So this means good qualities or good teachings. All good qualities are included and all good teachings are included in the Buddha's doctrine of the Four Noble Truths. So, yes, please, go ahead. ...truth of suffering. Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Death is suffering. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are suffering. Not to obtain what wants is suffering. In short, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. We found the same thing in the... Um, In the Samaditi Sutta, he does not include the section that is normally found before it says um, not getting what one wants. It says that association with the unliked or the uh, or the or the disliked is suffering, and separation from the liked is also suffering. I don't know. We don't know why Venerable Sariputta didn't include that. Uh, in his definition, but for some reason or other it's not included here and in, also in the Samaditi Sutta. And he has also not mentioned sickness. Normally it says birth is suffering, sickness is suffering, aging is suffering, and death is suffering. Why he hasn't mentioned sickness, again, we, we, we don't know, but he hasn't. But what he's doing now 
is to home in on the last part, the five aggregates affected by clinging are suffering. And the five aggregates are the five kandas. The word kanda is there, and there are five terms here. Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vijnana. This was the way that the Buddha analyzed a human being into these five groups. The translation is usually Rupa is material form or body. Vedana is feeling or sensation. Sanya is perception. Sankara is one of these words which has several different meanings, often translated as mental formations. And then the last kanda is vijnana, or consciousness. I did print out a sheet of Chaitasika. Anybody not got this sheet? Everybody else got Chaitasika? The term Chaitasika is actually taken from uh, the Abhidhamma But these 52 Chaitasika are the same as Vedana plus Sanya plus 50 Sankara. So altogether you've got 52. In this explanation, Sankara contains 50 different qualities but feeling and perception are isolated, given their own place. But in this analysis in the Abhidhamma, all of these 52 are linked to, or are tied together as Chaitasika. So uh, you, can, um, you can see what, what is meant by these sankaras. But the word sankara has several different meanings. Generally, the word sankara means making together. And this can either be an active making together, as in making a determination, an act of will, or it can be making together or constructing or compounding certain things. But it can also be a passive term, meaning that which has been put together, that which has been constructed or compounded. We meet the term Sankara in the Paticca Samupada. You may remember we looked at that a few weeks ago. And it is one of the twelve links. It is, in fact, the second link in the, in the circle of twelve. And there it means making together actions which generate kama. So it's sometimes called kama formations. Sankaras are kama formations, generating kama. It is sankaras which are responsible for the generation of a new birth and the maintenance, the sustenance of the being throughout the life. 
So sankharas can be mental, verbal or physical. And they can be wholesome or unwholesome. The second meaning of sankhara is any mental, physical or verbal function like um, in and out breathing would be a sankhara. That's a, that's a bodily function. Um, discursive thinking would be a mental sankhara. But Sankara also appears in this context as the fourth of the five aggregates. And they all arise in dependence upon contact with different kinds of sense objects. So here, these are reactions to what we experience. We have six, we call them sense doors. We have the eye door, ear door, nose door, tongue door, body door, and mind door. So we can have sankharas, being generated as a result of something arising through one of these sense doors. So you can say in this sense it, it, it refers to um, anything mental except for feeling, vedana, perception, sanya and consciousness, vijnana, every other mental quality is included in the term Sankara. And lastly, Sankara can also mean anything which is conditioned, anything which arises due to some preceding cause. Um, there's a verse in the Dhammapada, I think it's number 183, where it says, all conditioned things are impermanent. All conditioned things are unsatisfactory. <coughs> and the only thing which is not conditioned is the state of Nibbana. Everything else is conditioned and is therefore impermanent. None of these khandas has any real existence. They are all uh, components of experience, but the Buddha likened them to, uh, Rupa is likened to uh, froth. Um, a lump of froth. Uh, Vedana is likened to a bubble. Sanya is a mirage. No, sorry. Sanya is likened to a... No, that is a mirage. It's the next one. It's Sankara is likened to the stem of a plantain or banana tree. Maybe not, not everybody here knows about banana trees, but what, do you know how the banana trees, uh, what we would call in a tree, a trunk, if you cut into that, what do you find in the case of a banana or a plantain? Yeah, it's just, it's not woody, there's no real essence in there, there's no real wood there, it's just a, um, yes, it's just, yeah, that's all. So in that sense, it is not something um, durable. 
and then um, the, the last one, Vijnana, is likened to a conjuring trick. Yes? In the case of an onion, you don't expect to find anything hard inside, but with most trees, you do expect, after you've taken off the bark, to find some solid wood in there. Um, but in the case of the, of the plantain or banana tree, you don't get that at all. Yeah, the concept is that you've got layers and layers. Yes. Yes, and that's all. Yeah. 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 So, what was that banana tree similar to salt? That's similar to Sankara. I mean, I don't think there's a direct relationship between Rupa and Froth and Vedana and Bubble. It's just five different similes to explain five Kandas. And the point about all of these five similes is that it's, it's something which is very impermanent, something which is uh, always changing, and cannot be taken as anything solid or, or durable or lasting. Perception is like what? Perception is like a mirage. Uh, a mirage, you, you think you see something, but you don't. Um, but you can be, you can be, um, you, can be um, you can be made a fool of by thinking you've taken something there, you know, like the, the lake in, in the distance, you think there's a lake, but in fact, <laughs> yeah, nothing. So the term that <coughs> the Buddha uses here is the five aggregates affected by or subject to clinging. So this is upadana is the word for clinging. And this means that these five aggregates, because they are <coughs> subject to clinging, are unsatisfactory. They are impermanent, they are unsatisfactory, because we cling on to things which are ephemeral, which are changing, which do not last. The problem is not with the aggregates themselves, it's the clinging to them which is the problem. Uh, an enlightened being, an arahant, he is still, as long as he's living, he still has five aggregates, but he doesn't cling on to them. The rest of us, we cling on to these aggregates, and that is where the problem arises. The problem is not with the aggregates themselves, but it's, it's the action of clinging to them, which is the cause of dukkha, one form of dukkha arises due to this experience. And they act as a, as a fuel, or as a, like firewood for sustaining a fire. These aggregates, which we, by clinging onto them, they sustain the three defilements in the mind of greed, hatred, and ignorance. Let's go ahead, please. And what are the five aggregates affected by clinging? They are the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. And what is the material form aggregate affected by thinking? So from here on, <coughs> sorry, put uh, is now <coughs> going in on the material form aggregate, the rupa aggregate. He's going to set aside the other four aggregates and talk only now about the uh, rupa material form. Mm-hmm.
is the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. And what are the four great elements? They are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, and the air element. Well, I gave up last week <coughs> uh, a chart. So, we won't... We don't have to go into all of this in, in, in the high detail of the Abhidhamma, but we make a distinction between the four great elements, or the four great essentials, as they're called on this chart, earth, water, fire, and air, and then the other 24 are derived from these first four. So what Sariputta is talking about here, uh, it is the four great elements and the material form derived from the four great elements. So what he's referring to, the four great elements are numbers one to four on this chart, and then the uh, material form derived from the four great elements are the other material phenomena on this sheet. So the terms, <coughs> uh, the, the word is datu, uh, an, an element. The, the first four are partavi, apo, tejo, and vayo. Their qualities are solidity, fluidity, heat, and motion. All four have to arise together, and they're present to a varying degree in every material thing. So you can say that each one of these four has the other three as its immediate cause. It's called uh, reciprocal co-nascence. Sorry? Solidity? Yes, solidity or a part of the, it's, it's called here earth, part of the, but it's not literally earth, it's the quality of solidity. And then the second one, um, water. It's the uh, cohesion, uh, the binding uh, together of the material elements, the other elements. And again, fire. It's not literally fire, it means heat and cold. And then air means movement. So these are found in different combinations in all material things. And if you take, for example, water, in its liquid form, the element of Apo water is predominant. But if you cool water down sufficiently to form ice, then the hardness, the earth element, has become predominant. If you heat water up so that it becomes a vapor, then you've got vayu, the air element, has become predominant. So these qualities increase or decrease in any material thing, but everything has to have, to a greater or lesser extent, all of these four qualities. There's no material thing that doesn't have them to some degree or other. So we can, you can call them earth, water, fire, and air, or 
their properties um, solidity or, or, or um, extension it is it is what enables things to be um, built one on another because of the hardness quality the the water element makes things flow but also it binds things together if you get for example powder and you add a little water to the powder that binds the powder together and then the temperature element or heat or cold um, is present in everything sometimes things are very hot sometimes they're very cold sometimes they're somewhere in the middle and then the air element forms the function of of uh, mobility movement so if we take first of all the earth element the presence of the earth element enables objects to occupy some space if there was no earth element they would all just collapse and we can sense this element as hardness or softness so the, the table in front of you is hard you can feel that as, as something hard on the other hand if you if you hold your clothing you'll find it's much softer so there's a, a lesser proportion of the earth element there the water element has the characteristic of uh, flowing and um, cohesion it, it is because of this power of cohesion that things hold together and form a body we can't actually sense this element it's something which we can um, we can infer it by observing the qualities of a particular material thing fire is what maintains or the warmth the heat element is what maintains living things it makes them mature it makes them ripen because of the fire element fruit or vegetables become ripe so it is a vitalizing energy which is responsible not only for uh, the preservation of living things but also eventually their decay if the, if the if the earth sorry if the fire element deteriorates and disappears then things will decay and then lastly vio <coughs> this is what causes movement fluctuation oscillation vibration it's a, it's a dynamic aspect of rupa So now Sariputta is going to take just this rupa, just the material form, consisting of the four great elements, and he's going to analyze each of these elements and explain their functions and we shall see from this he is trying to help us understand the the impersonal nature of the earth element which will I hope become clearer as we go through with the next part please uh, 
What friends is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the earth? What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. That is head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sign, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, mesentery, content of the stomach, feces, or whatever else is internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified and clung to. Upadina Rupa what we uh, identify with, we wrongly identify with, as mine. And this is a mistake. We take things to be, this is mine, this I am, this is my self. We have this in the Alagadupama Sutta. Tanha, this is mine. This I am, mana, conceit. And this is my self. That's the wrong view, diti. So we misinterpret these objects, these material things. Which is, which is form part of this list, and we cling on to them and identify with them. We identify with them as mine, me, self. What Sorry Put is trying to do here is to explain to us that these things are not me, mine, self. It's a wrong identification. And these are called internal, but we also have external. External material things, maybe table, chair, all sorts of other things that we have around us. And that's all there is. If you'd like to read on with, with the next part of this uh, section. This is called the internal earth element. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth elements. Meaning that is all there is. It's just earth element. No me, no mine. We make the mistake of identifying with it as me and mine. Well, we usually do, not always. For example, <clears throat> you can say fingernails. We don't identify really with fingernails because when we cut our nails, we dispose of the cuttings and usually we're not attached to the cutting from the fingernail. We don't mind throwing away the fingernails. But that's not true with everything. Please. And that is actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. So we're trying to break this application. <coughs> and I'd like to read you a little bit of um, Buddha Gosa from the Vasudhi Magga, who has a, a very up to date um, simile here. He says that. Um, 
when he has discerned these formations <coughs> by attributing the three characteristics, that's <coughs> impermanence, anicca, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, and uh, anatta, no, no self, when he's uh, discerned these three characteristics and seeing them as void in this way, he abandons terror and delight. He becomes indifferent to them and neutral. He neither takes them as I nor as mine. He is like a man who has divorced his wife. Suppose a man were married to a lovely, desirable, charming wife and so deeply in love with her as to be unable to bear separation from her for a moment. He would be disturbed and displeased to see her standing or sitting or talking or laughing with another man and would be very unhappy. But later, when he had found out the woman's faults and wanting to get free had divorced her, he would no more take her as mine. And thereafter, even though he saw her doing whatever it might be with whomsoever it might be, he would not be disturbed or displeased, but would on the contrary be indifferent and neutral. So too, the meditator wanting to get free from all formations discerns formations by the contemplation or reflection and then seeing nothing to be taken as I or mine he abandons both terror and delight and becomes indifferent and neutral towards all formations so that is Buddha Gosa's explanation for us explanation from Sariputta about uh, it could be taken as global warming carried out to a rather extreme degree and it talks about the destruction of the earth and um, there is a section in the Anguttara Nikaya where the Buddha is talking and he says monks, conditioned phenomena are impermanent conditioned phenomena are unstable conditioned phenomena are unreliable it is enough to become disenchanted with all conditioned phenomena, enough to become dispassionate toward them, enough to be liberated from them. There comes a time when rain does not fall for many years, for many hundreds of years, for many thousands of years, for many hundreds of thousands of years. When rain does not fall, seed life and vegetation Medicinal plants, grasses and giant trees of the forest wither and dry up and no longer exist. So impermanent are conditioned phenomena, so unstable, so unreliable. It is enough to become disenchanted with all conditioned phenomena, enough to become dispassionate towards them, enough to be liberated from them. And there comes a time when, after a long time, a second sun appears. With the appearance of the second sun, the small rivers and lakes dry up and evaporate and no longer exist. So impermanent are all conditioned phenomena as before. There comes a time when after a long time a third sun appears. With the appearance of the third sun, the great rivers, the Ganges, the Yamuna, the Achiravati, the Sarabhu and the Mahi dry up and evaporate and no longer exist. So impermanent are conditioned phenomena. And then a fourth sun appears, the great lakes disappear and dry up, and then a fifth sun appears, the waters in the great ocean sink by various 
measurements down to uh, only enough to come up to one's ankles. And then there's a sixth sun, which causes the great earth to smoke, fume, and smolder, just as a potter's fire, when kindled, first smokes, fumes, and smolders. So with the appearance of the sixth sun, this great earth smokes, fumes, and smolders. And then there's a time when the seventh sun appears, and this great earth bursts into flames, blazes up brightly and becomes one mass of flame. And as the great earth is blazing and burning, the flame, cast up by the wind, rises even to the Brahma world. And when this great earth is blazing and burning, neither ashes nor soot are seen, just as when ghee or oil are blazing and burning, neither ashes nor soot are seen. So it is when this great earth is blazing and burning. So impermanent are conditioned phenomena, so unstable, so unreliable. It is enough to become disenchanted with all conditioned phenomena, enough to become dispassionate towards them, enough to be liberated from them. So that you can take as the, uh, an explanation of the end of certainly this world, the, the earth we live on, um, but not all of the different planes of, of existence are destroyed. It goes uh, up only to the Brahma worlds, not beyond. But the whole purpose of this, again, is to show that since everything is impermanent, subject to destruction, subject to uh, decay, we cannot take it as, as something lasting, durable, and we don't identify with it. We don't identify with the internal earth element, the, thing, the, the, the parts of the body which were previously explained, uh, explained, nor do we identify with any external earth element. All these things are just impermanent and not self. There's another sutta called the Aganya Sutta, which also talks about the destruction of the world and world systems. And again, uh, in the Aganya Sutta, it's a, it's a cyclical thing that, um, first of all, things are destroyed up to a certain level in the different planes of existence, but then there's expansion again. So the, 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 the picture we're getting, I think, from the Buddhist explanation is of a, a cyclical universe, one that expands, has some period of stability, and then contracts and is destroyed to a certain extent, and then it expands again. And so it goes up and down, expansion and contraction, development and destruction. If you want to look this up, one, this one up, uh, Garmini, it's in the Book of Sevens, because it talks about seven sons. With reference to these external elements, that if these external objects are so impermanent. And what about something as trivial or small as our body? If even the whole world is impermanent, what about the body? That surely is impermanent too. Passionately. I was wondering where compassion comes in. But as you look at it as in terms of the elements and you know, start, start seeing things as they really are, um, just trying to think through where compassion comes in. And well, I, I think we have to look at things on two different levels, what we call conventional truth and ultimate truth. Now this analysis into four main or four primary elements 
and the 24 secondary or derived elements. This is going into great detail. Uh, the Buddha said that there were four ultimate realities. And rupa, material form, is one of these ultimate realities. And you can't analyze it beyond that point. Which is true if you are looking at things from the point of view of ultimate truth. But not all his teaching was concerned with ultimate truth. He also wanted people to be able to live happier lives in the present day, in the here and now. And so he would talk about conventional truth, you and me, and he talked about the um, four Brahma Viharas, the four divine abidings, one of which is compassion. And for the purposes of day-to-day -day living, interacting with other beings, compassion is brought in as a very important quality. But it's only called a Brahma Vihara. It's a divine abiding. It doesn't lead to enlightenment. So you've got two levels of of explanation or two levels of understanding. Yes, so please go ahead. Yeah. Now there comes a time when the water element is disturbed and the external earth element vanishes. When even this external earth element, <coughs> great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change. What of this body? which is clung to by craving and lasts for a little while. <clears throat> there can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. So then, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass a bhikkhu, who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus. This painful feeling born of the ear contact has arisen in me. That is dependent, not independent. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. Then he sees the contact is impermanent. That feeling is impermanent. That perception is impermanent. That formations are impermanent. And that consciousness is impermanent and his mind, having enters into that very objective support, enters into taking it to be impersonal and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. So the, <coughs> the painful feeling, that's the Vedana, is born of contact, fasa, and because it is dependent on something else, it is impermanent. And so he sees that contact is impermanent, feeling is also impermanent, perception, formation, consciousness, that's all of the aggregates, all the khandas, are impermanent. And because of that, if he understands them properly, then his mind can acquire confidence and steadiness and uh, resolution. Please. If others attack the bhikkhu in ways that are unwished for, undesired and disagreeable, by contact with fist, cloth, sticks, or knives, he understands thus. This body, of, this body is of such a nature that contact with fist, 
clothes, sticks and knives assail it. But this has been said by the Blessed One in his advice on the simile of the soul. Because even if bandits were to severe to serve your savage you savagely limb for limb with a two handed soul, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be following my teaching. So tireless energy shall be aroused in me, and remitting mindfulness established. My body shall be tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. And now let contact with fists, clods, sticks and knives assail this body, for this is just how the Buddha's teaching is practiced. Mindfulness and concentration. <clears throat> this simile of the saw is a very well known simile and <clears throat> is a very high ideal for us to try to live up to. And the idea that we could maintain uh, control of our mind even if we had our limbs being cut off by a two-handed sword. That's a very high degree of uh, mental control being developed there. But this reminds me of um, a conversation which took place between the Buddha and a monk called Punna and the people of Sunya Paranka. Is anybody familiar with this conversation? The Buddha has given Puna a teaching and then he says to the Buddha, where are you going to go and live now? And Puna says, I'm going to go and live in the country called Sunna Paranta. And then the Buddha says to him, Puna, the people of Sunna Paranta are fierce. They are rough. If they insult and ridicule you, what will you think? If they insult and ridicule me, I will think these Sunna Paranta people are civilized, very civilized, is that they don't hit me with their hands. That is what I will think. But if they hit you with their hands, what will you think? I will think these Sinaparanta people are civilized, very civilized, in that they don't hit me with a clog. But if they hit you with a clog, I will think these Sinaparanta people are civilized, very civilized, in that they don't hit me with a stick. But if they hit you with a stick, I think the Sunaparanta people are civilized, very civilized, in that they don't hit me with a knife. And if they hit you with a knife, I will think the Sunaparanta people are civilized, very civilized, in that they don't take my life with a sharp knife. But if they take your life with a sharp knife, if they take my life with a sharp knife, I will think there are disciples of the Blessed One who horrified, humiliated and disgusted by the body and by life have sought for an assassin. But here I have met my assassin without searching for him. This is what I will think. <coughs> this is what I will think, Blessed One. Good, good. Very good. Possessing such calm and self-control, you are fit to dwell among Isuna Paranka. <laughs> now it is time to do as you see, as you see fit. I think it's, the reference here is that some monks were so disillusioned with life, so fed up with life and, 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 and the, the problems and the sufferings of life, they wanted to bring their lives to an end. So, 
this is an example where um, Kuna could could die under um, favorable circumstances. But, uh, that if, he was, if he was murdered by these people, then it wouldn't be a bad thing after all. But he developed a measure of detachment and objectivity to his body. This is the, what we're trying to understand here, but let's get to it. the Dhamma and the Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency thus, it is a loss for me, it is no gain for me, it is bad for me, it is no good for me, that when I thus recollect the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, Equanimity is supported by the wholesome, does not become established in me. Just as when a daughter-in-law sees her father-in-law, she rouses a sense of urgency to please him. So too, when that bhikkhu thus recollects the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency. But if, when he recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established in him, then he, satisfied, he is satisfied with this. And that point, friends, much has been done by that bhikkhu. This word, a sense of urgency, Vega. and also translated as religious emotion. It is said that the Buddha himself experienced this Sangveda when he was still Prince Siddhartha and he saw what we call the four heavenly messengers. The uh, sick person, the old person, the corpse, uh, and the one in the second, which is what stimulated <coughs> his decision to leave the entire life and take up the life of the of wandering ascetic. In the last, in the, uh, the Parinibbana system, the Buddha's last day, the Buddha also uses this word sense of urgency or some vega. He says there are four places which arouse this. The four places of pilgrimage, they sometimes call it. Anybody know these four places? Where the Buddha is born. <laughs> Where the Buddha attains enlightenment. Where he delivers his first sermon. And where he passes away. These are four places which allow some days. And uh, Buddha Gosa has a slightly different explanation. He has eight things which give rise to San Vega. And his eight are birth, old age, disease, death, suffering in the lower state of existence, lower that means beneath the human brain, the misery of the past, rooted in the cycle of rebirth, endlessly cycling along in samsara, the misery of the future, rooted in the cycle of rebirth, 
we look forward with our happiness to going on fasting through the samsaric existence. And the misery of the present rooted in the search after food. So, this is using Sanjayda in a slightly different sense. I think it's, it, 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 you, you think about these things as a wake-up call. Don't fritter away this existence. Make effort now. Because if you don't, you're going to experience more suffering in samsara. So this gives you a stimulus, which you think, yeah, I don't want to go on suffering around in samsara, I, I better go move on. I better make use of my precious human life and do my best to attain enlightenment. So that is, that is another sense of urgency. So he says that if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency. So ideally he should develop equanimity. But if we don't, then at least we can develop some data. Water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, and clung to. That is bile, and phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water watery and clung to this is called the internal water element now both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element and what should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus this is not mine this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees as is actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. Now there comes a time when the external element is disturbed. It carries away villages, towns, cities, districts and countries. There comes a time when the waters in the great ocean sink down a hundred leagues, two hundred leagues, three hundred leagues, four hundred leagues, five hundred leagues, six hundred leagues, seven hundred leagues. There comes a time when the waters in the great oceans stand seven fathom deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great oceans stand half a fathom deep, only waist deep, only knee deep, only ankle deep. There comes a time when the waters in the great oceans are not enough to wet even the joint of a finger. When even the external water element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a little while? There can be no considering that I or mine or I am. So then, if others are Dubal's cold Harris Abiku, who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus. This painful feeling born of the ear contact has arisen in me. That is dependent, not independent. 
dependent on what? Dependent on contact. Then he says that contact is impermanent. That feeling is impermanent. That perception is impermanent. That formations are impermanent. And that consciousness is impermanent. And this mind, having entered into that very object, taking it to be impersonal, and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. Now, if others attack that bhikkhu in ways that are unwished for, undesired, and disagreeable, by contact with fists, clods, sticks, or knives, he understands thus. This body is of such a nature that contact with fists, clods, sticks, and knives assail it. But this has been said by the Blessed One in his advice, in his advice on the simile of the soul. Because even if bandits were to severe your savagely limb from limb, the two-handed soul, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be following my teaching. So tireless energy shall be aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness established. My body shall be tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. And now let contact with fist, clod, sticks and knives assail this body, for this is just how the Buddha's teaching is practiced. When the, when the bhikkhu thus recollects the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency thus. It is a loss, of, it is a loss for me. It is no gain for me. It is bad for me. It is no good for me. <coughs> that when I thus recollect the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, equanimity is supported by the wholesome, does not become established in me. Just as when a daughter-in-law sees her father-in-law, she rouses a sense of urgency to please him. So too, when that bhikkhu thus recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he rouses a sense of urgency. But if, when he recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established in him, then he is satisfied with that. At that point, friends, much has been done by that before. So, any, any questions about that uh, section? For the benefit of the lady who's just joined us, uh, <laughs> um, we're working our way through this long sutta spoken by Venerable Sariputta, in which he has been trying to show us how to develop a measure of objectivity towards both, um, well, here, towards physical qualities, what we call rupa, material form. And material form is divided up into the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. And in each case, Sariputta explains the nature of this particular quality and how taken both within our own body and by looking at the outside world these uh, elements cannot be taken to be something personal to ourself and normally we take things in terms of three three qualities tanha mana and diti this is mine tanha this I am, uh, 
Kamana, uh, and this is myself, Diti. And so, because we take these as having a personal quality about them, this gives rise to the aggregates of clinging, which is the last part of the Buddha's definition in the First Noble Truth of Dukkha. So the, the, what, what Sariputta is trying to say is that by clinging to these aggregates, we are allowing Dukkha to arise. That all of these aggregates are impermanent, they are constantly changing, and we cannot consider them to be I, or mine, or myself. So that is how Dukkha arises. You take what is impermanent to be permanent. Uh, the five aggregates are listed under Kanda, Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara and Vijnana. Sariputta has taken Sankara formations as the particular aggregate he is talking about here. And we've finished now two of the elements. We've looked at the earth element and the water element. Now we're going to look at the fire element. The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery and clung to. That is, that by which one is warmed, ages and is consumed. That could be the word metabolism in those days, but uh, that could be what it is referring to here. And that by which what is eaten, drunk, ages, consumed, and tasted, gets completely digested, or whatever else is internally belonging to oneself, fire, fiery, and clung to, that is called the internal element, are simply called fire element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus, it actually is with proper wisdom. One becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element. Now there comes a time when the external fire element is disturbed. It burns up villages, towns, cities, districts and countries. It goes out due to lack of fuel only when it comes to green grass or to a road or to a rock or to water or to a fair even space. There comes a time when, the, when they seek to make a fire even with the Fox, feather, or a hide pairing. This is saying this is a futile, a futile attempt to make fire. Maybe by rubbing uh, a cock's feather, or some translations it says a wing bone. Uh, rubbing that with um, a, a, t a hide pairing or, or a tendon. You, you can't make fire by rubbing these two things together, but there was an attempt, uh, a hopeless attempt to do so. When even this external fire, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance and change. What of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a little while? There can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. 
So then, if others abuse, revile, scold, harass a bhikkhu, who has seen this element as it actually is, he understands thus. So then, if others abuse, revile, scold, and harass a bhikkhu, who has seen this element as it is actually is, he understands thus. This painful feeling born of the ear contact has arisen in me. That is dependent, not independent. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. Then he sees that contact is impermanent, that feeling is impermanent, that perception is impermanent, that formations are impermanent, and that consciousness is impermanent and his mind, having entered into that very object, taking it to be impersonal, and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. Now, if others attack that bhikkhu in ways that are unwished for, undesired, and disagreeable, by contact with fists, clubs, sticks, or knives, he understands thus. This body is of such a nature that contact with fists, clods, sticks, and knives assail it. But this has been said by the Blessed One in his advice on the simile of the soul. Because even if bandits were to severe you savagely limb from limb with a two-handed soul, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be following my teaching. So tireless energy shall be aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness established. My body shall be tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. And now let contact with fists, clods, sticks and knives assail this body for this is just how the Buddha's teaching is practiced. When that bhikkhu thus recollects of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he arouses a sense of urgency thus. It is a loss for me. It is no gain for me. It is bad for me. It is no good for me. And when I thus recollect the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, equanimity is supported by the wholesome, does not become established in me. Just as when a daughter-in-law sees her father-in-law, she rouses a sense of urgency to please him. So too, when the bhikkhu thus recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, if equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established in him, then he rouses a sense of urgency. But if, when he recollects the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established in him, then he, satis then he is satisfied with it. At that point, friend, much has been done by the bhikkhu. Is that just a repetition? It's very repetitive. Yes, it is. Yes. In fact, we can probably cut out a little bit. If you just uh, continue with the wind element and read the first paragraph. Air element. What friends is the air element? The air element may be either internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. That is, upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the belly, winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is airy, is air, airy, clung to. This is called air element. 
and that should be seen as it actually is, with proper wisdom does. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted towards the air element. Next one, sorry. Now there comes a time when the external air element is disturbed. It sweeps away villages, towns, cities, districts, and countries. There comes a time in the last month of the hot season when they seek wind by means of a fan or bellows, and even the strands of straw in the drip fringe of the thatch do not stir. Even when this external air element, great as it is, is seen to be impermanent, subject to destruction, disappearance, and change, what of this body, which is clung to by craving and lasts but a little while, there can be no considering that as I or mine or I am. The strands of straw in the drip fringe of the thatch. I think this refers to houses or homes which had a thatched roof and the edge of the uh, thatching was left not trimmed back. It was hanging free and therefore could be seen to move around if there were any wind but uh, in this case there is no wind so the, the thatch does not stir. I think that um, section we got to the end of uh, verse uh, 25 um, in each case, he's taken the four elements and explained we cannot take them as I or mine or self. In, um, in the Anguttara Nikaya, he explains this, or the Buddha explains this rather more briefly when he's talking to his son Rahula. And he says, Rahula, the internal earth element and the external earth element are just the earth element. This should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Having seen this thus as it really is with correct wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element, one detaches the mind from the earth element. And he then says the same thing with the other three elements and finishes off by saying, when Rahura, a monk does not recognize a self or the belongings of a self in these four elements, he is called a monk who is cut off craving stripped off the fetter and by completely breaking through conceit has made an end of suffering. So this is the whole purpose of this uh, discourse is to help us to break the identification with these elements seeing them as me and mine and self and if we can break that wrong identification then we can make an end of suffering, enlightenment, which is, the, of course, the, the ultimate goal. Um, we say, this I am. I am something important. I am the, the, the mayor of evening, or this I am, uh, that you have certain
qualities which define you as I am this, I am this kind of person, I'm very clever, I'm very wealthy, I'm very very handsome, very hard working, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And then Diti is a view, a wrong view, and the view is this is myself. We take the second Well the second one is the idea that I am this kind of a person. The, 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 the deity is the view that this forms a self, um, that this, this quality, whatever it is I'm examining, makes up a self, a, 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 um, a person, that myself is um, composed of this particular, in this case it's an element, this element makes myself, myself, this is myself, I, it is defined mm -hmm. by this earth element or this water element. Sure, I <laughs> but what, one is, is, a, is a defilement of the mind in the sense that it is seeing things uh, in terms of um, a form of conceit the other one is, is a form of ignorance that we don't understand things correctly therefore because of the ignorance in our mind we take something to be self when it is not but all of these three are, are, are kind of interrelated, interconnected but it's, it's, these are different ways in which we identify with certain what are certain things in this case with with the elements which are simply they're just elements that's all they are there is just the element of hardness it's, it's not mine i can't control it i can't I, I shouldn't identify with it it's just that's all there is just this particular element in an ultimate sense, we don't have a self, there is no self. But for conventional purposes, it is very useful to talk about a self in the sense of I or you. And the Buddha used conventional terms often when he spoke to both monks and to lay people. He would talk about this is this will be very beneficial for you this will be very damaging for you that you is a conventional term just as we form the view that outside in the street now you will see a car parked there the car is simply a concept. It's, it has no independent reality. A car is simply a collection of hundreds and hundreds of different parts put together and we say, oh yes, that's a car. But it has no independent existence. We can break that car down into its component parts. Uh, the Buddha, I think, talked about a, a cow. And then you can call it a cow. But that is only a conventional term. The term cow is designating merely a conglomeration of different parts. And he said if you get the cow, uh, a, a cow butcher or a cow butcher's apprentice comes along, they will cut the cow into pieces legs head ears body so where's your cow gone? the cow was simply a concept it had no independent 
existence any more than a car has an independent existence. These are just concepts. So in an ultimate sense, all there is, in this case, is rupa, material form, or um, one of the elements, which is explained in great detail here. That the, the material form is made up of these four great elements and none of them can be taken to be a real self they're just material things or um, qualities such as hardness or softness temperature but we invest them with the wrong concept of having some property of being mine and confirming that I have a real solid existence. In, in conventional terms we talk about you yes. so that um, by using conventional terms we have Paula and we have Asanka. If I want to talk to one of you I use the name Asanka or I use the name Paula. If we didn't have these conventional terms life would get very very complicated and be a lot of muddle and confusion. So we need conventional terms but we should recognize that that is all they are. They're labels that in ultimate sense the Buddha said there are only four ultimate truths. Mind, or uh, citta, mental qualities, or cittasikas, material form, rupa, and nibbana. These are the four ultimate truths. We cannot analyze them down into anything further. But if I want to talk to you, I wouldn't say um, I want to talk to this uh, this uh, temporary <laughs> aggregation of mental and physical qualities which are working together according to a process of cause and effect and which cannot be identified as a lasting, enduring self. It's not easy to talk about you. 